As the fifth generation of video games came to a close, gaming would then experience a stunning rise in popularity. As the medium grew, so too would gaming companies, budgets, and games, marking the sixth generation of video games as a true expansion into the modern era. In my previous video on the subject, I stated that the PlayStation was the progenitor to horror being revolutionized, as it was the canvas for the artist to truly paint a picture. But the following generations of video games would make room for other consoles to share some of the horror limelight. Sega's Dreamcast refined some survival horror elements that were established with the first PlayStation. Sony let developers do what they did on the original, but better, with the PlayStation 2. Nintendo got out of its comfort zone by licensing acclaimed IP like Resident Evil. And the first Xbox offered another way to play, a more powerful and sophisticated hardware. Please stick with me as I go over the golden age of horror within video games, as well as the overview of the genre today. This was the sixth generation of horror in video games. The Sega Dreamcast was the final console released by the company after their seven previous systems, and it's an interesting one at that. Being the first sixth generation video game console, the Dreamcast was in a very awkward stage in comparison to its peers. I mean, hell, they were trying to compete with this, not this. While Dreamcast was better than the PlayStation 1 and 64 hardware-wise, it would soon struggle to catch up later in its life cycle, due to the rapid success and technical marvel that was the PlayStation 2. However, this does not negate the Dreamcast in any way, it was still a fun console that just released too little too late, or early, depending on your perspective. The one star of the Dreamcast, however, was of course Resident Evil Code Veronica, a survival horror game that was originally published by Capcom in 2000 and later ported to the other consoles with an expanded version titled Resident Evil Code Veronica X, just a year later. Being the fourth main installment in the Resident Evil series, Code Veronica is also the first debut on a separate platform from the PlayStation. The story takes place three months after the events of 1998's Resident Evil 2, and concurrent with the destruction of Raccoon City seen in 1999's Resident Evil 3. Resident Evil 2 and 3 also featured on the Dreamcast alongside Code Veronica, with slight bonuses added from their PlayStation version. The story of Code Veronica follows Claire Redfield and Chris Redfield in their efforts to survive a viral outbreak at a remote prison island in the Southern Ocean and a research facility in Antarctica. The game retains traditional survival horror controls and gameplay of the previous installments. However, unlike the pre-rendered backgrounds of the previous games, Code Veronica uses real-time 3D environments and dynamic camera movement, a big step up graphics-wise. Unfortunately, in terms of breakout horror hits, the Dreamcast was only able to land Resident Evil, and even that was short-lived, since the console lost support only a year after Code Veronica was released. However, I would like to point out some other horror games that were developed for the Dreamcast, games you most likely have never heard of. Please keep in mind I can't mention every single game here, these are only games that piqued my interest. Carrier is a survival horror game developed for the Dreamcast, notable in part for being fully 3D, much like Code Veronica. The story synopsis of Carrier is as follows. An investigation team known as Spark is sent into the Heimdale, which is an advanced aircraft carrier. When the team's helicopter starts to land on the Heimdale, a surprise attack is initiated, separating the team. It is from there that dangerous mutants attack the main characters in their search for the truth. D2. The Mighty Ducks is a sequel to the 1995 horror game D. In D2, you reprise the role of Laura, but play an independent story unrelated to the original D, as well as using action-oriented gameplay in contrast to the fully FMV puzzle-driven predecessor. The majority of D2 involves exploring the Canadian wilderness from a third-person perspective, while interior locations are encountered from a first-person perspective. When exploring the wilderness, the player encounters random battles, much like that of a traditional Japanese role-playing game. When fighting monsters, the player cannot move Laura, but only aim her weapons. Defeating these creatures earns Laura experience points, which are used to level Laura up, increasing her health limit. It is quite obvious D2 was heavily inspired by Parasite Eve, as well as Silent Hill, the former due to its turn-based combat and the latter because of the snowy terrain and the manipulation of fog effects. Illbleed is a survival horror game developed by Crazy Games and was published in April of 2001. The game consists of six stages represented as movie theaters. The goal of the game is to complete each stage by fulfilling each unique objective. However, these stages have traps and enemies designed to kill the player throughout. Despite being financially unsuccessful, Illbleed received a cult following for its notable combination of non-linear gameplay elements and its B-movie style comedy horror theme, dialogue, and voice acting.
Regardless of opinion, the PlayStation 2 was the main star of the sixth generation in terms of both quality and quantity of games, as well as being the most reasonable choice for consumers to buy due to its DVD and CD functionality. It's still the highest selling video game console of all time, and a relic to all of our minds. When looking back at the PlayStation 2, there is a noticeable difference seen within the console in comparison to the ones that came before it. The PlayStation 2 might be the darkest and most scary video game console in all of history, which is why it is the perfect machine for horror to live on. And that it did. Setting the stage for horror games in 2001, Team Silent perfected what was seen within Silent Hill within their next entry into the franchise, Silent Hill 2. The story revolves around James Sunderland, a widower who journeys to the town of Silent Hill after receiving a letter from his dead wife, informing the man that she is waiting there for him. There in the desolate town lie people as well as freakish monsters to torment the inhabitants of Silent Hill. Rather than a cult seen within the first game being the primary antagonist, Silent Hill 2 was focused on the psyche of the main protagonist, being a true manifestation of psychological horror. Silent Hill 2 received critical acclaim within months of the release in North America, Japan, and Europe. Over 1 million copies are sold, with the greatest numbers of sale in North America. During the release, it was widely praised for its story, use of metaphors, symbolism, psychological horror, taboo topics, soundtrack, atmosphere, graphics, monster design, and sound design. However, it received criticism for its rudimentary and frustrating controls. Two years later, Team Silent would hit again with the release of Silent Hill 3 in 2003. The third installment to the Silent Hill series is a direct sequel to the first game that was released all the way back in 1999. Following Heather Mason, the daughter of the protagonist from the first game, Heather becomes entangled in the machinations of the town's cult, which seeks to revive a malevolent deity. Through this, Heather must go about the town defending herself from monsters and solving puzzles alike. Silent Hill 3 was praised for its terrifying set pieces and eerie atmosphere that is just so iconic with the series. However, the game was criticized for not improving its sub-arcane play experience, which was seen within the previous entry. The last Silent Hill game we saw from Team Silent was 2004's Silent Hill 4 The Room. Unlike the previous installments, which were set primarily in the town of Silent Hill, this game was set in the southern part of the fictional city called Ashfield and follows Henry Townshend as he attempts to escape from his locked down apartment. During the course of the game, Henry explores a series of supernatural worlds and finds himself in conflict with an undead serial killer named Walter Sullivan. Silent Hill 4 features an altered gameplay style, but third-person navigation and plot elements from the previous installments remain. Upon its release, the game received generally favorable critical reaction, and its departure from the typical features of the series received a large range of reactions. Most longtime fans were displeased with the game's focus on action, a trend within survival horror that had been on a steady incline. But as stated before, these were the last games Team Silent ever made, as Konami felt the IP would be better off in the hands of Western developers. And boy were they wrong. The next two Silent Hill games to feature in the generation were Silent Hill Shattered Memories and Silent Hill Origins, both being pretty mediocre at best. However, the long-lasting reputation of the four main Silent Hill games remains prevalent in the modern-day gaming ecosystem, as the series was a benchmark of the gaming landscape. Silent Hill's reign during the sixth generation wasn't just restricted to the PlayStation 2, however, as both Silent Hill 2 and 4 were playable on the original Xbox, as well as PC, and Silent Hill 3 was also available on PC. As to why Silent Hill 3 is absent on the original Xbox is purely speculatory, but it may have something to do with the game's connection with the first, which Sony had some say over story-wise. And so, the end of Silent Hill began. Now before I get into other substantial games of the generation, allow me to highlight some other games of substance. Once again, I can't mention every horror game ever made, these are just ones that piqued my interest. Extermination is a 2001 first party survival horror game released for the PlayStation 2. The game was used as a showcase for the system at trade shows before the PlayStation 2 release. Extermination was developed by the original members of the Resident Evil team. In Extermination, you portray Dennis Riley, a Marine Special Forces recon operative on an Antarctica mission to stop the outbreak of a virus mutating people into unearthly creatures. The game was considered the first survival horror game released on the PlayStation 2 and generated hype among critics, but Extermination only received mostly average reviews, and over time, the game quickly faded into obscurity. Siren is a survival horror stealth game developed by Project Siren, 
a development team within Japan Studio and published by Sony Computer Entertainment for the PlayStation 2 in 2003. The game's plot revolves around an interconnected cast of characters that possesses a power that enables them to see and hear what a nearby character sees. Siren is divided into stages, each taking place in one of ten areas in the rural Japanese village of Hanuda. To complete a stage, the player must accomplish a primary objective that usually involves reaching an exit point, subduing undead enemies called Shibito, or finding an item. Objectives in different stages are interconnected via a butterfly effect, and a character's actions in one stage can trigger a secondary objective in another stage. The game was shepherded by Kachiro Toyama, the creator of Silent Hill after he departed from Konami in 1999. Toyama would soon join Sony's own Japan studio in creating this new IP that is Siren. The game received average reviews with unanimous agreement that the game delved into new and interesting concepts but lacked on a gameplay front, as most of the objectives were seen as tedious. The game was followed up by a sequel only seen in PAL regions, a remake, a loose film adaptation, and two manga adaptations. Developed by Tecmo for the PlayStation 2, Fatal Frame was risen to popularity in North America, most likely due to the release of the film Ring in 2002. Set in the year 1986, the story follows siblings Miku and Mafuyu Hanasaki. When Mafuyu disappears while searching for a famous novelist in the haunted Himaru mansion, his sister begins the journey to find him. During her exploration of the mansion, she discovers clues as to the fate of those who entered, must fight hostile ghosts, and discover the truth behind the dark ritual that took place there. The gameplay focuses on the siblings exploring the mansion and fighting off hostile ghosts using a special camera. Praise for the use of the camera was given to Fatal Frame for creating a sense of tension with a beautiful melding of sound and visual design. However, the game had some difficulties with the controls, but was generally praised for its atmosphere and interesting gameplay. Co-produced by Capcom and Sunsoft for the PlayStation 2, Clock Tower 3 became the fourth and final installment of the Clock Tower series, and was the first and only video game directed by Japanese film director Kenji Fukusaku, known for prominent Yakuza films dispersed throughout the 70s. Unlike the previous Clock Tower games, the plot and characters have very little relations with the previous entries, as the story follows a 14-year-old by the name of Alyssa Hamilton, who is a part of the family lineage of female warriors who traveled through time to defeat evil spirits. Also, unlike the previous games, the point-and-click aspect of Clock Tower had been replaced by a more contemporary gameplay, assuming direct control over the protagonist. Alyssa is given no weapons for the majority of the game and must evade and hide from her pursuers. These enemies, known as subordinates, are fought at the end of each level, during which Alyssa is armed with a longbow. The game received mixed reviews and was a commercial failure selling considerably less than anticipated. The presentation, writing, and graphics were positively received, with many critics praising the cutscenes and Fukusako's direction. However, the gameplay was criticized for its repetitive mechanics and the game itself was felt to be too short, making Clock Tower 3 the last in the beloved series. Echo Night Beyond is a 2004 survival horror adventure video game developed by From Software for the PlayStation 2. Being the third game in the Echo Night series, Echo Night Beyond tells a science fiction ghost story set in the not too distant future. Players take on the role of a newlywed, off for a honeymoon on the moon. The vessel crashes before reaching its lunar resort destination, separating the just married couple and leaving the protagonist alone at an abandoned research base. Players explore the station from a first-person perspective inside a spacesuit. In addition to the many spiritual anomalies that haunt the station, strange lunar lights and the relative weightlessness add to the atmosphere of the game's environments. Unfortunately, the game received mixed reviews as the puzzles are notoriously difficult, leaving many players frustrated. Another survival horror video game developed and published by Capcom for the PlayStation 2 in 2005 Haunting Ground follows the story of Fiona Belly, a young woman who wakes up in the middle of a dungeon after being involved in a car accident. She quickly befriends a white shepherd who is named Huey and begins to explore the castle with his aid to seek means of escape and unravel the mysteries of it and its inhabitants. The game shares many similarities with the aforementioned Clock Tower 3 and has been described as a spiritual successor to the Clock Tower series. For the first time in video game history, Nintendo finally fell from its pedestal during the fifth generation of video games through the introduction of the Nintendo 64. 
A neat console with some stellar games, but in contrast to the PlayStation, both developers and the consumer couldn't resist the better choice. The main shortcomings of the N64 was its use of cartridges, a format that Nintendo was very reluctant to shy away from. You see, CDs not only gave developers more space to fully complete their vision for a game, they also provided higher sound quality and were substantially cheaper to produce than cartridges. The only benefit cartridges had on CDs was that load times were all but non-existent. Nintendo learned from this mistake following up the 64. Well, kind of. They resorted to discs but opted instead to use mini discs, as they wanted to avoid piracy issues that were so prevalent within the PlayStation as well as the Dreamcast. The mini CDs were also a Nintendo creation that offered substantially less space for developers to work with once again, but it was cheaper to produce. Anyways, the GameCube is a special console, filled to the brim with classic Nintendo whimsy charm. But the GameCube was also an experimental shift for Nintendo, a shift we haven't seen the likes of for decades now. The GameCube allowed horror to flourish. Introducing Luigi's Mansion The 2001 launch title developed and published by Nintendo was a noticeably strange game all around. For one, it was a Mario-related launch game that didn't feature Mario. Secondly, the game was very different tone-wise in comparison to other Mario-related games and spin-offs. While you might not consider Luigi's Mansion to be a horror game, it cannot be disputed that the game offers a wide array of horror-related themes and iconography. The game could be considered a baby's introduction into survival horror. Now I don't say that as a slant against the game, but all Mario-related products are definitely geared towards children. And I'm sure Luigi's Mansion definitely browned some pants. Anyways, in Luigi's Mansion, players control a little green Italian as he explores a haunted mansion searching for Mario and dealing with ghosts by capturing through a vacuum cleaner supplied by Professor E. Gad. Luigi's Mansion is the most successful GameCube launch title to date and became the best-selling game of November 2001. It sold 257,000 units during its first week sale in the United States. According to Nintendo, the game was a large driving force behind the GameCube's launch sales and sold more copies in its opening week than Super Mario 64 had managed to sell. The game is referred to as a masterclass in game design and was followed up by two sequels, Luigi's Mansion, Dark Moon for the 3DS, and Luigi's Mansion 3 on the Switch. A remake of Luigi's Mansion for the 3DS was released in 2018. Given the rampant success Resident Evil had been experiencing in the previous generation, Nintendo was due for a tone shift. The zombie horror Master Chief changed video games forever, leading many companies to try their piece in horror. Nintendo saw this and branched out of its comfort zone, acquiring Resident Evil for the duration of the GameCube's life cycle. Though Resident Evil 2 featured on the Nintendo 64, the Resident Evil IP would soon find a new home on the GameCube, starting with the remake of the very first game. Developed by Capcom Production Studio 4 and published by Capcom, the remake of the 1996 PlayStation game Resident Evil was released for the GameCube in North America on April 2002. The story takes place in 1998 near the fictional Midwestern town of Raccoon City, where a series of bizarre murders have taken place. The player takes on the role of either Chris Redfield or Jill Valentine, stars agents sent in by the city to investigate the murders, as I'm sure you know by this point. Resident Evil was developed over the course of one year and two months as a part of an exclusivity deal between Capcom and Nintendo. It was directed by Shinji Miyakami, who also directed and designed the original Resident Evil. Miyakami decided to produce a remake because he felt the original had not aged well enough and that the GameCube's capabilities could bring it closer to his original vision. The remake retains the same graphical presentation, with 3D models superimposed over pre-rendered backgrounds. However, the quality of the graphics was vastly improved. The remake also features new gameplay mechanics, revised puzzles, additional explorable areas, a revised script, and new story details including an entire subplot that was cut from the original game. Along with being praised for its graphics and improved gameplay, the remake is often described as one of the best, scariest, and most visually impressive entries into the Resident Evil franchise. However, the game sold worse than expected, leading Capcom to change its direction of the series into a more action-oriented approach. Alongside this deal, all previous entries to the Resident Evil franchise were ported over to the GameCube, featuring the likes of Resident Evil 2, 3 Nemesis, and the one-time Dreamcast exclusive Code Veronica. Interestingly enough, when the exclusivity deal was signed, it was said that all three of these games were to be remakes of their PlayStation counterparts. However, this could have either been a mistranslation or an overstatement, 
as the workload it would have taken to remake all these games would have been tremendous and most likely would have lasted the entire generation. Next to feature on the GameCube was Resident Evil Zero, the first solely Nintendo Resident Evil game. Resident Evil Zero is a prequel to the first game, covering the ordeals experienced in the Arklay Mountains by the Special Force Police Unit Stars Bravo team. The story follows Rebecca Chambers and convict Billy Cohen as they explore an abandoned training facility for employees of the pharmaceutical company Umbrella. The gameplay is similar to other Resident Evil games but adds the ability to switch between characters to solve puzzles and use unique abilities. Torture's development for Resident Evil Zero began in 1998 on the Nintendo 64. In fact, the partner system was created to take advantage of the short load times possible within the capabilities of the Nintendo 64 game pack. However, the cartridge format also provided limitations, as the storage capacity was significantly less than that of a CD-ROM. The team had to approach the design differently from the previous entries, to conserve storage space. Funnily enough, Resident Evil Zero was designed to be more difficult than the previous Resident Evil games. Being inspired by their first horror game, Sweet Home, the team removed the item storage boxes presented within the earlier games and introduced a new item dropping feature. Development slowed when the team encountered memory shortage problems, and so production was moved to the newly announced GameCube. When the switch occurred, the game had to be completely rebuilt, with only the concept and the story carrying over. Resident Evil Zero received generally positive reviews. Critics praised the graphics and audio for building a haunting atmosphere. Opinions on the new partum and item systems were mixed, however. Some found the changes were an improvement and added new layers of strategy. Others believed the changes were cumbersome or non-innovative. The controls were panned as outdated, and Capcom was criticized for not evolving the series' tank controls that had been ever so prevalent within the horror games for almost a decade now. Then, in 2005, the crown jewel of Resident Evil's GameCube era was released. Panned by critics and fans alike, gaming would see what many would consider to be the best entry in the entire Resident Evil franchise. I of course am talking about Resident Evil 4, the survival horror third-person shooter developed and published by Capcom. Players would regain control of Leon S. Kennedy, who is now a U.S. government special agent sent on a mission to rescue the president's daughter, Ashley Graham. Set in rural Spain, Leon fights hordes of villagers infected by mind-controlling parasites. Resident Evil was part of the Capcom 5, five video games that were unveiled by Capcom in late 2002 and published in March of 2003. At the time when Nintendo's GameCube had failed to capture market share, Capcom announced these five GameCube titles with the apparent goal of boosting hardware sales and showing off third-party developer support. Resident Evil 4, however, was the star child of the five, regarded as one of the most influential games of the 2000s, particularly due to its influence in redefining the third-person shooter. Similar to Resident Evil Zero, Resident Evil 4 would also feature a tortured development cycle, with numerous reworks and tone changes taken into effect. Let's tackle these one by one. Around the turn of the millennium, Resident Evil 2 writer Noboru Sugimura created a new story for a Resident Evil game, based on Kamiya's idea to make a cool and stylish action game. The story was based on unraveling a mystery surrounding the body of the protagonist, named Tony, an invincible man with supernatural skills and an intellect exceeding that of normal people. Kamiya felt the playable character did not look brave or heroic enough in battles from a fixed angle, so he decided to drop the pre-rendered backgrounds from the previous installments and use a dynamic camera system. Though the developers tried to make the coolness theme fit in the world of Resident Evil, Miyakami felt it strayed too far from the series' survival horror roots, and gradually convinced the stab to salvage what they could and make an independent game. This of course would become the beloved new Capcom franchise, Devil May Cry. Development on Resident Evil 4 restarted around the end of 2001. This revision, commonly dubbed the Fog version, was directed by and was 40% finished at that time. The game saw Leon S. Kennedy struggling to survive after having infiltrated a castle like Umbrella's main headquarters, located in Europe and featuring traditional Resident Evil monsters such as zombies. During the course of the new story, Leon becomes infected with the progenitor virus and possesses a hidden power within his left hand. The producer of the final version has also gone on stating that Ashley did not appear back then, though there was a different girl who was never revealed to the public. During E3 2003, Capcom showcased a version widely known as the Hookman version. The story was set in a haunted building where Leon contracted a bizarre disease and fought paranormal enemies, such as animated suits of armor, 
living dolls, and a ghost-like man armed with a large hook. The game had an otherworldly feel to it, containing elements like flashbacks and hallucinations that were marked by a bluish tint and shaking camera. This version is very obviously reminiscent of Silent Hill. It also displayed various gameplay mechanics that carried over into the final release, like the over-the-shoulder camera and a laser sight for aiming in battles and quicktime events. Other features such as dialogue choices were removed later. The hallucination version had only a basic story concept, having dropped the previous scenario penned by Noboru Sugimura. It was explained by RE3 scenario writer Yasuhushi Kawamura that he was responsible for this version, as he wanted to make Biohazard 4 scarier. He said, quote, I suggested using a particular scene from the film Lost Souls, where the main character suddenly finds herself in a derelict building with a killer on the loose. An arranged version of this idea eventually turned into Hookman. The idea went through several iterations as Mr. Sugimura and I have carefully refined this world, which I have to say was very romantic. Leon infiltrates the castle of Spencer, seeking truth, while inside the laboratory located deep within, a young girl wakes up. Accompanied by a bow dog, the two start making their way to the castle. Unfortunately, there were many obstacles they needed to overcome, and the cost of development was deemed too expensive. The final version of Resident Evil 4 was very different from its previous iterations. After the commercial failure that was Resident Evil Remake, it was decided that the series needed to lean into more action-oriented gameplay, rather than horror. Shinji Miyakami has gone on stating, quote, With Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3, and all the rest of the series before Resident Evil 4, I was always saying to the staff, scaring the player is the number one thing. But for the first time, in Resident Evil 4, I told the team that fun gameplay is the more important thing. Nintendo and Capcom were adamant that Resident Evil 4 was a sole exclusive, with developers going on record stating that the game isn't going anywhere but the GameCube, Miyakami even stating that he would chop his own head off before such a thing were to happen. Then, nine months after Resident Evil 4's initial release, it was released on the PlayStation 2. The Resident Evil IP had an interesting time on the 6th gen, with arguably its best run of Resident Evil games to date, featuring on many different consoles for many different reasons. It's with this that I bring the second Resident Evil chapter to a close. The last horror game on the GameCube that was of substance was a psychological horror action adventure video game developed by Silicon Knights and published by Nintendo. In the year 2000, Silicon Knights were signed by Nintendo to create games exclusively for its consoles, during which time it produced Eternal Darkness, Sanity's Requiem. Much like Resident Evil Zero, Eternal Darkness was initially planned for the 64, but relocated to GameCube development soon after. While the game features similar gameplay mechanics to that of Resident Evil, it distinguishes itself with unique features such as sanity effects. The game's setting is centered around a mansion in Rhode Island, the home of the protagonist Alexandra Rovas' grandfather, and the mysterious book known as the Tomb of Eternal Darkness that Alexandra finds there. The game is presented in a third-person action-adventure perspective, in which the player must navigate several locations as 12 characters spanning different time periods. Eternal Darkness maintains notable differences in gameplay style, in comparison to other survival horror games. Eternal Darkness was widely praised by reviewers and won numerous awards but was not a commercial success. A direct follow-up to the game was cancelled by Nintendo, and Silicon Knights a decade later went bankrupt and disbanded. Attempts by the game's writer and director Dennis Dyack to make a spiritual successor entitled Shadow of the Eternals failed both of their Kickstarter campaigns, leading the project being placed on indefinite hold. In the years since Eternal Darkness's release, it has been regarded as one of the greatest games of all time as well as one of the best horror games ever made. As I stated before, the Dreamcast was the final nail in the coffin for Sega in the console market. Their console sold less than anticipated despite how great of a machine it was, so it was discontinued in 2001. This left a hole in the gaming market, a hole for another company to fill, a company that had little to no experience in the gaming market. I of course am talking about Microsoft and the Xbox. A great console with four major games, two of those being Halo games. What many, I feel, don't know about the original Xbox is its stellar support of third-party games. 
Counter-Strike, Spider-Man, Half-Life, Grand Theft Auto, and Marvel vs. Capcom 2 were all games I suspect you didn't know reached the console, but alas, they did. Unfortunately, unlike Nintendo and Sony, Microsoft didn't have any major horror exclusives. Like 90% of its catalog, most of these games were on other consoles at these times, as well as PC in some cases. So for the last time, allow me to explore some horror games that are featured on the Xbox during this time. You might have noticed during the PS2 segment, I didn't mention Fatal Frame 2, Crimson Butterfly. That's because I saved this title for an enhanced port that was released on the Xbox in 2004. The second installment in the Fatal Frame series features an independent story with little relation to the first title. The story follows twin sisters, Mio and Mayu Amakura, as they explore an abandoned village and experience encounters with the paranormal. Their lives quickly become threatened when the village spirits begin to possess Mayu and target them as sacrifices for an ancient ritual. Players must use a camera with powers of exorcism to defeat enemies and uncover the secrets of the village. Because many players were too frightened to finish the original, Tecmo made the sequel's story more interesting to encourage players to see it through and finish the game. Despite this, however, horror was still the central focus of the game. This port included many new features in comparison to the original game, including a first-person mode, a survival mode, new costumes, and a new ending dubbed the Promise Ending. Upon release, Fatal Frame 2 received positive reviews and is widely considered to be among the most scariest video games ever made. The Fatal Frame series would see another entry in this generation, with the release of Fatal Frame 3, The Tormented on PS2 in 2005, another hit for this underrated series. The iconic Doom franchise made it to the OG Xbox with their entry Doom 3. The 2004 survival horror first-person shooter video game was developed by id Software and published by Activision. Doom 3 is set on Mars 2145, where the military-industrial conglomerate has set up a scientific research facility in the field such as teleportation, biological research, and advanced weapons design. The teleportation experiments open a gateway to hell, resulting in catastrophic invasion of the Mars base by demons. The player controls a space marine who fights through the base to stop the demons from attacking Mars and reaching Earth. Doom 3 is the first reboot of the Doom series, ignoring the events of the previous games, and what made this game so scary in the comparison to its predecessors was its significantly darker and more ambient tone. The fully 3D monster design, sound, and gore was really unnerving, resulting in the scariest Doom game to date. Doom 3 was a critical and commercial success. With more than 3.5 million copies of the game sold, it is the most successful game by developer id Software to date. The game was followed by Resurrection of Evil, an expansion pack developed by Nerve Software in April 2005. A series of novelizations of Doom 3 written by Matthew J. Costello debuted in February 2008, and an expanded and remastered edition titled Doom 3 BFG Edition was released in 2012. Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth a survival horror video game developed by Headfirst Productions for the Xbox in 2005 and for Microsoft Windows in 2006. It combines an action-adventure game with a relatively realistic first-person shooter and elements of a stealth game. The game is based on the works of H.P. Lovecraft, author of The Call of the Cthulhu and progenitor of the Cthulhu Mythos. It is a reimagining of Lovecraft's 1936 novel, The Shadow Over Innsmouth set mostly in the year 1922. The story follows Jack Walters, a mentally unstable private detective hired to investigate Innsmouth, a strange and mysterious town that has cut itself off from the rest of the United States. In development since 1999, the project was repeatedly delayed, going through several revisions and having some of its most ambitious and immersive features abandoned and the initially planned PlayStation 2 version was canceled. Although well received by critics, Dark Corners of the Earth was a commercial failure. At least two more Cthulhu Mythos games were planned by Headfirst Productions, including a direct sequel titled Call of Cthulhu, Destiny's End, but neither were completed due to Headfirst bankruptcy. A 2005 survival horror third-person shooter video game developed by Darkworks and published by Ubisoft was released on the Xbox by the name of Cold Fear. It was Ubisoft's first horror game and Darkworks' second game after Alone in the Dark, The New Nightmare in 2001. The game is centered on Tom Hansen, a member of the United States Coast Guard, who comes to the aid of a Russian whaler, the Bering Strait, and finds a mysterious parasite that has turned the crew into zombie-like creatures. Discovering the involvement of both the Russian Mafia and the CAA, Hansen sets out to ensure the parasites don't reach land. Cold Fear was met with mixed reviews, with many critics comparing it unfavorably to Resident Evil 4. Although critics were generally impressed with the environments and the opening scenes, 
They found that the game was too short and it failed to live up to its promising beginning. The game was a commercial failure by February 2006. Developed by Rockstar North and published by Rockstar Games, Manhunt was released for the PlayStation 2 in November 2003, followed by Microsoft Windows and Xbox releases in April 2004. Set within the fictional Carcer City, the story follows James Earl Cash, a death row prisoner who is forced to participate in a series of snuff films. Earning his freedom by murdering criminal gang members is sent to hunt him on camera. Manhunt is a stealth-based urban horror-style game played from a third-person perspective. The game consists of 20 levels called scenes, as well as four unlockable bonus scenes. Players survive the scenes by dispatching enemy gang members occasionally with firearms, but primarily by stealthily executing them. Manhunt was subject to significant video game controversy due to the level of graphic violence depicted being banned in several countries and implicated in a murder by the UK media. The game received positive reviews from critics and won several accolades with particular praise directed at its dark, gritty tone and violent gameplay. While not a commercial hit, Manhunt developed a substantial cult following and was followed by a standalone sequel, Manhunt 2, in 2007. Obscure is a survival horror video game developed by Hydrovision Entertainment and published by Dreamcatcher Interactive in North America in 2005. The story revolves around three teenagers who set out to search for their missing friend. Finding themselves locked inside their high school overnight, they now have to get to the bottom of the strange occurrences. The player controls these teenagers as they explore the school and battle a number of different types of infected students. Discovering that they are harmed by light, the game received mixed or average reviews all across the board on all consoles. Released for the Xbox in the year 2002, the video game adaptation of the classic film The Thing would be spawned into existence. The Thing is a third-person shooter survival horror video game developed by Computer Artworks and co-published by Vivendi Universal Games under Black Label Games and Konami. Sans a sequel to John Carpenter's 1982 film, the story focuses on Captain Blake, a member of the U.S. Special Forces team sent to the Antarctic outposts featured in the film to determine what has happened to the research team. The game was endorsed by Carpenter, who even has a cameo in the game. The Thing was a commercial success selling over 1 million units worldwide across all platforms receiving generally positive reviews. A sequel was in the early stages of development but was cancelled when Computer Artworks went to receivership in 2003. To wrap this video up, I would just like to state how significant this generation of horror games was to pop culture and media altogether. Both Silent Hill and Resident Evil received film adaptations that, well, vary in quality, but they became cult figures in pop culture. Take for example Pyramid Head, arguably the most iconic thing about Silent Hill, even more iconic than the foggy town itself. Pyramid Head has become a flagship figurehead in horror. Ask almost anyone about the humanoid monster and they'll most likely know more about him than the entirety of Silent Hill. On top of this, Resident Evil 4's influence on gaming can still be seen today, especially with an acclaimed series like Dead Space and even The Last of Us. Without these games, horror and gaming would be in different spaces, for better or for worse. The inclusion of Pyramid Head in anything that is not Silent Hill 2 does negate the meaning of the game, which is unfortunate, but becoming a horror icon is not easy to do, when most monsters are pretty cut and paste, Pyramid Head included in my opinion. Horror within the PlayStation 1 revolutionized the medium, making zombies popular once again. But horror on the 6th gen was truly the golden age of the genre, but I would be remiss not to mention the sudden uptick in survival horror these past few years. Ever since the release of PT in 2014, horror games have been trying to replicate the special sauce that was seen within the demo. This of course led to a ton of mediocre walking similar to games that take place within a house, but PT inspired the return of Resident Evil, with Resident Evil 7 and 8 four years later. Resident Evil 2 and 3 also got remade for current gen systems, and Resident Evil 4 is on its way. Because of PT, as well as Resident Evil, horror is now in a bit of a renaissance, with games like Alone in the Dark set to return, as well as rumors of a new Silent Hill game or remake being created at Konami. Even new IPs like the Callisto Protocol look ever so promising. Some of you may have missed the revolution of horror, and only grazed some of the games during its golden age, but now you are here, experiencing the survival horror renaissance, so enjoy it while it lasts.